All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. On today's episode, I'm extremely excited. Someone I've wanted to get on for quite some time, Dr. Sandra Kaufman. And then Dr. Sandra Kaufman is going to have to listen to her bio for a second here. So I apologize in advance, but she began her academic career in the field of cellular biology, earning a master's degree from the University of Connecticut in tropical ecology and plant physiology. Turning to medicine, she received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed a residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins in the field of pediatric anesthesiology. She has been the chief of pediatric anesthesia at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital for nine years, a nationally recognized center of excellence. Her avid interest in the science of anti-aging began many years ago as an intense hobby, utilizing her knowledge in cell biology human pharmacology and physiology, this hobby has now become a main focus, as we'll hear about with her books. The project represents years of non-clinical research leading to the first ever comprehensive theory of aging. She has now released two books on longevity, the first one being The Kaufman Protocol, which when I looked inside the book cover, I was surprised it was all the way back in 2017. And then just recently, in the last couple of months, she released more or less an updated version called the Kaufman Protocol Aging Solutions. And of course, we're going to touch on both of those books because it's chock full of information. But without further ado, Dr. Sandra Kaufman, further known as Sandy, welcome to the Red Light Report. (laughs) Thank you. Fantastic (laughs) introduction. Very uh, Makes me sound better than I am. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so just for the audience, I first met Sandy back in 2019 at what's called RadFest, which is a conference for anti-aging and longevity where businesses, individuals come learn and share information regarding anti-aging and longevity, where of course Sandy is a speaker and that's where BioLite was first exposed to the world in the public eye was at RadFest. And so Sandy had a uh, a booth there as well, uh, selling her books. And this isn't just any book. And I don't know how often Sandy gets this, but when I read her first book, it was one of my favorite books of all times. Because when you get into the health and wellness and biohacking and anti-aging and longevity sphere, it's hard not to become at least somewhat obsessed with supplements. The new word I learned in her first book was adjuvants. So supplements and adjuvants, and that's what her books are all about. It's the top, most research-backed supplements and adjuvants, and I'll let Sandy speak on this because it's going to be a little more eloquent, but she basically breaks down which ones are most advantageous for certain actions, for example, the mitochondria and and anti-inflammatory and so on, but I'll let Sandy kind of dive into what was the impetus for you, other than a hobby, what was your major motivation for diving so deeply into the anti-aging and longevity side of things. Oh gosh, that is so many, uh, so many topics that you just plowed through. So yes, number one, we did meet at RadFest uh, as a little ad for RadFest. It's October this year in San Diego, and it is a fantastic, I like to think of it as a meet and greet for anyone that's interested in the longevity field. Again, all the big players will be there. I'm speaking many people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if anyone's listening, uh, RadFest is a fantastic place to be. Number two, I became obsessed with the idea of longevity probably about 10 years ago. As you mentioned in my bio, I did start out as a cell biologist. So I'm always intrigued at the lowest level that you can get. And I guess you could go go subatomic particle, but that's not me. So I like cells. Cells are absolutely fantastic. And if you look at aging from a cellular perspective, you can see that there are very specific mechanisms whereby cells fail over the course of time. What I ended up doing is categorizing this for my own well-being because it was driving me nuts. And again, years and years ago, I sat there reading every possible theory of aging I could put my hands on. My office looked like, you know, a post-it factory sort of blew up and there's scribbles everywhere. And over the course of time, it sort of divided itself into seven essential piles, which became the seven tenets of aging. And it's very boring cellular stuff. It's, uh, you know, DNA changes and mitochondria and genetic pathways. And, you know, there's there's seven big things. And and obviously there's subcategories within that. Uh, But then the idea was, okay, well, if we know specifically why cells age, what do all of these things actually do in those piles, right? When I entered this world, people were taking supplements and and I'll explain adjuvants in a second because they're like, you know, their grandmother's best friend's brother's uncle said, hey, this is good for you. You should do this. I'm like, 
I'm really not sure if that holds water. So I went through every possible scientific study that I could find. And this obviously took me years and years and years and years. And I realized that different agents do things in different categories and some do them better than others. So I'm old fashioned. I had a big old piece of paper sitting on my desk and it was a grid system of the seven tenants and then all of these agents that I would stumble onto and what did they do in each category? And it started out as check marks like, you know, this does well, this doesn't do squat, this one gets a zero. And then it was like, ooh, this one's really good, check, check, or check, check, check. And that ultimately evolved into a numerical rating system whereby then I had to actually set rules for my own self, right? What actually made it something a zero or one or two or three, et cetera. But I did. And so all of that is very sort of now cut in stone. And so now every agent that I look at has a seven digit rating number that tells you exactly what each thing does in each of the seven categories, which then, you know, abracadabra turned longevity into an, a mathematical algorithm instead of a guessing game. And that is what book one essentially covers. And it goes through the top 14, 15 agents, because that's what was popular at the time. What did they do? How did they do it? How well did they do it? Et cetera. And I, people were pissed that I didn't cover their favorite agent. And I looked at a whole lot of things that people were taking and decided that, yeah, they just really weren't worth taking at all. And then, so I, I put this book out. I didn't know anyone in the longevity world. It was kind of like a free for all, like here, have some information. It's written moderately tongue in cheek, as well as some like really nasty, sciencey, tough stuff to get through. I didn't write it for anyone in particular, other than sort of myself. As a result of this, I don't know, it has some sort of become this like, folk hero, bizarro book that people really love. And I'm, I'm kind of excited that that happens. Yeah, I guess that's where it was for me. I just randomly came upon it through Amazon because I order a lot of different these types of books. And one of the suggestions was this Kaufman Protocol book. And I'm like, what the heck is this? What's a Kaufman Protocol? But it was so highly rated. And I would continue to see it over and over again in my suggested books. I eventually ordered it. And it became one of my favorite books of all time. So go figure. But one of my questions would be kind of like you spoke upon is a lot of these quote unquote popular supplements or adjuvants didn't make the cut. So I have a couple of questions for you. A, what are some of those that didn't make the cut that people like take all the time? And then B, how many of these, especially for the first book, let's say, because I think there's 14, like you said, how many did you research? before you cut it down to that 14? I imagine there had to be either dozens and dozens, if not a hundred or more. I don't know, you tell me. Oh yeah, it was dozens and dozens. So let's first just supplements versus adjuvants, just to yeah. make life easy for everybody. Everyone in the real world thinks that a supplement is anything that you sort of take, it's a pill. Or there are other people call them vitamins and minerals, which is kind of crap. All of these things have very specific definitions. And in my world, a supplement is something that you are supplementing that you already have endogenous levels of. So the you know easiest example is carnosine. We all have carnosine in our bodies. You take extra, you are supplementing your levels. An adjuvant is something that your body has never seen. For example, astaxanthin comes from an algae. We don't make it ourselves. It's all from your diet. Therefore, it is an adjuvant. And the reason that this is important is that because supplements have feedback loops and adjuvants do not. And that dictates how much you can take, how it gets metabolized, and then a variety of other factors. So in my world, it's pretty important. And everyone just sort of clumps them together, but realistically, you shouldn't. So that's, that's point number one. So what are people taking that don't really do anything? This depends on your goal. For example, I only use things that attribute to the seven or help with the seven tenets of aging. Other things may help you feel better or make you think that you're feeling better. Like ashwagandha is a perfect example. Everyone loves ashwagandha. When you get down to the cellular level, it doesn't really do anything for longevity. It may help you in other regards, uh, but in terms of living better, maybe not necessarily. The other things that really bugs people is that they confuse deficiency with longevity. So clearly, if you are deficient in things, it is going to hurt you. But if you take extra, it's not going to help you. So D is one of those things. Everyone gets mad at me because I don't want to include D. We measure our D levels. And if you are deficient, clearly that's not good, right? Has immune issues and a variety of other things. But if you add more to your pile and make you super D uh, saturated, you're not helping yourself. So that doesn't count as a longevity agent. But you're absolutely right. I went through, I don't know zillions of these things. And at the time, no one was also doing longevity research. So what we knew I could put in there, but I, you know, you can't venture a guess on something that you don't know about. 
And one of the cool things that I've learned since then is because the science is becoming sort of more and more directed towards cellular mechanisms, things that we know were good are actually getting better and better and better. So that's kind of cool. So retrospectively, the number system in the first 15 agents that I put out three years ago is a little outdated because now we have more evidence in various categories. And so, you know, at some point I got to redo all of those, but I just keep plowing ahead looking for uh, new cool stuff. So I haven't gotten to it yet. I guess you're saying 15 because you're putting resveratrol and terastilabine as two. Yeah, it's the, uh, they're cousins and there's a little bit of a difference, but they're sort of in the same chapter. So it's, right. yeah. In the book, you say the research at that time was showing terastilabine might be more advantageous. Is that still the case? Years and years later? Yeah, yeah. So there are two caveats to that. So number one, bioavailability of versant agents wasn't a big deal. So no one was making like higher bioavailability stuff. So it was veritrol unto itself is less bioavailable than Patera still being therefore that one sort of wins. Since then, they are making bioavailable formulas. So that that boosts it. And then there was a study that came out that suggested that if you had any issues with elevated lipids, that Patera still being could be bad for you. So if people obviously have lipid agents, I tell them to take resveratrol as long as it's a bioavailable form. On the other hand, if you can't get a bioavailable form and you don't have any trouble with your lipids, I think the terastilbene is still the better agent. That's a good point. It's like you lay out based on your structure, you know, with your seven tenants and your scoring system, how they stack up based on the research and science. But like you just alluded to just with resveratrol and terastilabine, there's still some caveats you need to consider. And that's something you you have in your closing chapter of your newest book behind me here, that it's like if you're trying to reduce your sugar levels or, you know, your AGEs and or maybe you're trying to do fat loss, it's like, yes, here's here's the supplements and adjuvants that can help. But these are other things you need to consider. And these are other things you need to consider. It's not just a one size fits all, of course, it's an N equals one and and then some. But quickly, I'm just going to go down the list of the of the first book just so people know what's in there. A lot of them you've heard of, maybe some of them not. So, of course, there's resveratrol, terastilabine, astaxanthin, of course, I've talked about that, and that's thanks to Sandy. Then there's NAD, curcumin, carnosine, metformin, alpha-lipoic acid, apigenin, sulforaphane, quercetin, EGCG, astralagus, melatonin, and pyridoxamine. So those are the agents in the first book. And again, she goes into the chemistry, the science, the research, what they help with, what they don't help with, and so on and so forth. And then in her newest book, I believe there's about 28. So there's twice as many. Same concept where she breaks down. In this one, I think the history is like, you know, this is from thousands of years ago from traditional Chinese medicine. And they thought it would increase your vitality and your chi. And this was used in Ayurvedic medicine. So a lot of the stuff that she is citing is from nature, which I love. They're plants. They're not synthetic chemicals or made in a lab. They come from nature. And a lot of them have been revered for thousands and thousands of years. But it's just now with the research and the science that we have, the people like Sandy are bringing it back into the public's eye of how important, how uh, advantageous they are, especially for longevity and anti-aging. But quickly, Sandy, before we move on to this newest book, you have what you call the panacea based on your first book. Does that still hold up today or has that changed since you've gotten this updated book, which as you alluded to before we started recording, <laughs> is almost outdated. And that's how it is when I'm doing this red light therapy research and I'm making my own ebook. By the time I release the newest edition, there's already you know, several dozen pieces of research I wish I could have added. So it's just this non-ending perpetual incoming information that you wish you could update instantaneously. So does the panacea still hold up or would you change that now based on what you know today? You know, funny, I actually stand stand by the panacea. And the reason is it's tried and true. And it covers most of the reasons that we age and the sort of the easiest way to do it. I will say that there's probably three more agents that should be on the panacea now. But when I designed the panacea, I'm like, you know, I asked, you know, a billion people, how many agents would you take just offhand? And, And the answer was always five. Somehow six seemed like far too many and four seemed chintzy. So it was always five. So it, that's what it became. Right. So in terms of hitting all of the big areas, there it's just it it just does it right. So granted, not one agent does one thing; it's all very variable, right? Just, which that's the rating system. But in general, the panacea number one it starts with the P, right? So it's pterostilbene, which can be substituted out as resveratrol. That is the, one of the major sirtuin activators still. 
hits most of the sirtuins, doesn't hit all of them. Uh, my, my Lewis latest uh, black hole that I went into, I'm very specific now into which sirtuin gets activated by what. So uh, we need to worry about one, three, and six, and that's whole other agents. But in general, you need to start with one. So that, that that's pterostomium over resveratrol. You must have a free radical scavenger, must, right? Astaxanthin is probably the best. As you said, it comes from nature. And I don't actually care if things come from nature or not. But what I think is insanely cool about that is that plants, they're not very transient, right? They tend to be very location dependent. So they can't change their environment. They have to change to their environment. So wherever a plant is, be it all sorts of stresses, let's say high salinity or you know hypoxia or cold temperatures, whatever physiologic stress a plant has, it develops mechanisms for fixing it for their cells. And I love the idea that we can tap into what they have figured out over millions of years uh, just to make our lives easier, right? So astaxanthin makes this fantastic, or astaxanthin is this magnificent goo, the stuff in bird baths make, that slimy green stuff, in response to physiologic stress. And it, and it helps us. And it's all over the ecosystem, safe as can be, just an amazing substance. The only issue is it's fat soluble, which is kind of cool. You have to take it with food. So in the original panacea, if you're going to take five things, absolutely everyone should be on astaxanthin. As far as I'm concerned, it should be in the drinking water. That being said, you know, the, the updated caveat is you need a water soluble and a fat soluble free radical scavenging system, and you need to make sure it gets through the blood brain barrier. So, you know, for upgrades, I add um, andrographolide because it also, I know we know it gets through the blood brain barrier a little bit better. And that way, depending on which part of your cell you're trying to get into, you have uh, increased efficacy. The third thing in the panacea is nicotinamide. Absolutely, crucially important. Well, I knew it when I wrote the first book. Now we just know that it's even more important. I'm sure everyone listening to this is already pretty well versed in nicotinamide, but for those who don't, here's my like two seconds uh, explanation. It does four major things in the cell. It is necessary for the electron transport chain. It is necessary as a sirtuin coenzyme. It is necessary for DNA repair mechanisms because it's part of the PARP system. And this is used as a communication device between the mitochondria and the nucleus. So as you are over 40, you are by definition nicotinamide deficient unless you're extraordinarily lucky. And therefore all of those four systems fail over time. Thus nicotinamide is crucial to any longevity category, which is why it's still part of the panacea. PAN, absolutely you must have some sort of anti-inflammatory in any longevity program. Inflammation, systemic inflammation, as we all know, shoots up just exponentially as you get older for many, many reasons. One of the best ones is still curcumin. Um, the caveat there, of course, is it has to be bioavailable, and there's the escalating race to see who can make the best of bioavailable. Of course, I have my favorites. Other people have their favorites, but I think it's crucial. And then the last category that you have to hit, of course, is glycation, like glycational kilosol. Pyridoxamine is amazing. That would have been a choice. The availability is, is sort of like hard to get these days. They sort of cut it out of the American market, so it's a pain in the ass. But the easiest thing is carnosine, so I think everyone should be on carnosine. Granted, there are now innumerable other transglycosylators, and I have an entire seven-step program to get rid of glucose, but as a primary step, carnosine like still wins. So that would be the five basic agents of the panacea. And that brings up actually one of my questions, because I remember you in one of your interviews when the first book came out, I think it was with Ben Greenfield, you got into the vision or the eye health and vision component of carnosine. And it, actually in your newest book, that's what it reminded me, I think. Or was it your first book? I guess it was the first one. Astaxanthin plus carnosine is gangbusters for eye health and for vision. And in that interview, I think it was with Ben Greenfield, you talked about this carnosine eye drop, visomitin, and is it SKQ1 or the... So those are, so, right, those are two different eye drops. You're sort of squashing that, that idea together. Clarify those it are, for me. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's fine. So carnosine, right, is a transglycosylating agent. So the vision is very complex. Old people vision, which is called presbyopia, which is the inability to focus up close, right? Everyone pulls out their, their reading glasses in restaurants and you're probably too young for that, but all of my cadre do, except me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, the lens gets old for several reasons. One of which is it gets like oscillated, which means AGEs land on it and just gets very stiff. And carnosine is a known transglycosylating agent, so it can actually help reverse the stiffness, which makes focusing significantly easier. 
So carnosine eye drops are extremely popular. There, there are many, many brands that make it. Um, the problem is most of the brands burn a little bit, so people don't like it. But there are one or two that uh, make it so that they don't burn. And, and obviously, I use those. Visomitten is a completely different idea. Visomitten is an SKQ1 uh, system. So it's basically a mitochondrial activator, and free radical scavenger, incredibly potent. Unfortunately, they come from Russia. For a while, you could get them and it was super easy, but that is more retinal-based versus lens-based. So it's completely separate, but still incredibly good for your vision. Gotcha. So would that be considered almost a trifecta then, astaxanthin, carnosine, and visomitten? Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's always like the big ones and then there's more you can throw in there, right? Lutein sure. is, is important. There's zeaxanthin. All the xanthins are extremely good for vision. So if you think about your retina, and I'm always, it's just amazing to me, right? Um, all the things we don't like about tissue is oxygen use and glycosylation, right? That's That'll kill you. This is what gets focused in your in, in your eyeball, right? The retina, every, light not only is there, it gets focused there. So huge influx of free radicals that are just going to like sort of kibotch your, your retina over the course of time. And, and glucose, right? Your retina has more mitochondria and more glucose utilization because it's an incredibly energy intensive system. So we seriously need to protect it. And of course, the blood flow to your retina is not so great, especially to your lens. There's very little flow to your lens. So these are areas that just absolutely must be protected. And I kind of consider like vision sort of like the canary in the coal mine, right? Everyone assumes their vision is going to sort of like drop with age. And it is one of the first things because it's just going to take the biggest hit. The good news, of course, is we have tools to sort of prevent that. Yeah. And along that note, that's a good segue into, I was as you were talking, I'm thinking, well, maybe this is a, a different trifecta or a quadfecta with the aforementioned strategies plus red light therapy, because there's, especially the last year or two, copious amounts of research showing how you can reverse or prevent or mitigate age-related macular degeneration and other retinopathies with just really a minute or two of red light therapy. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, this piece of research, Sandy, I've said it multiple times on the podcast here, but one red light therapy session in the morning once a week led to statistically significant increase in visual and color acuity for the entire week. So it was just, wow. it was like one or two minutes Monday morning and it lasted for a whole week. I did not know that, but I can tell you it helps with vision, but he, okay. So here we're going to turn this around. I get to interview you. Here's my <laughs> question. So, so as, as you know, and I don't know if people that know this, so I do a huge proponent of red and infrared light therapy. And I sit there uh, for eight minutes in front of my thing every night. It helps me sleep and it helps my skin. And every night I have this debate with myself, if I should use the goggles or not use the goggles to get the light into my eyes or not. So now I'm going to turn to your expertise. What do I do? Goggles or no goggles? Yeah, this is a good discussion. So for eye health, and this is a question I get all the time, because of course, with red light therapy devices, you're going to be provided goggles. And that's by and large, because of liability issues. But secondly, to protect yourself, because most of the panels that uh, are, are on the market, including BioLite, the light irradiance or the light power is so high, that you wouldn't want to look straight into the LEDs for long at all. And I'm talking seconds, let alone minutes. Because when you look at the eye health research for photobiomodulation, the light irradiance is much, 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 much lower than these panels are putting out if you're doing most treatments six to 12 inches or so. So if you're going to use one of these panels, you'd want to be several feet away with your eyes open. And even then you'd want to look off at an angle, not necessarily directly into the LED. So to answer your question, if you're doing like eight minutes, how close are you to the device in general? About eight to 10 inches. Yeah. About right. So typical about that six to 12 inch range. Personally, I just keep my eyes closed. Okay. But no, no goggles, eyes closed. That's what I do personally. Okay. I'll and that. if you're doing something eye health specific, again, either you want a device that's lower light irradiance, because that's what most of them are. They're closer to the even 10 to 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared, whereas the panels are more 100 to 150. So again, if you're going to use those panels, either your eye treatments are going to be extremely short because that's going to be a lot of jewels at a given time of light, or you step way back to decrease the light irradiance at, at a given distance. And then you can do that standard, you know, 60 to 90 second treatment. But just like the skin, another superficial tissue, the dosage is much, much lower compared to most other treatments, such as the brain, joints, muscle, organs, because the light doesn't have to pass through anything to activate or, or therapeutically alter the tissue. 
so maybe so maybe i'm guessing maybe you do like a minute without the goggles and then the rest of the session with the goggles would would that be acceptable little bang for your buck and then i'm just trying to make it easy on myself (laughs) yeah you could I, i would do closer to a quarter or half with your eyes closed because again with eyes closed you're you're putting something going through tissue yeah. yeah whereas right. most most uh, eye health protocols you're literally looking into the light so that's what i'd say a quarter to a half and then you yeah. the okay. goggles on for the rest all right that's because fair. because to your point if you were to do the entire eight minute session with your eyes closed you would probably get um i don't want to say overdose but you would over treat for improving your eye health. So you wouldn't do any damage necessarily, but you wouldn't get the benefits you're looking for. And that goes for all protocols. If you're going same thing for skin health or or even uh again improving your joint health or organs, if you over treat, there's close to no negative side effects other than you're not getting the results you're looking for. So to your point, if you want to optimize eye health, you have to do it for a couple minutes and then throw the goggles on just to make sure your eyes don't get too much light. Again, not to do damage, but just because you want to see those improvements. Nice, nice. So yeah, that's a great question. That's a good clarification because I get that question all the time. And of course, there's that safety concern. We all don't want to lose our eyesight or or decrease our uh, vision. So back to you, Sandy. (laughs) Let's talk about the new book for a moment here. So so the Kaufman Protocol Aging Solutions. Again, we jumped from about 14, 15 supplements, adjuvants to 28 which of these are you most fascinated by or excited by in the, in this new book? So what happened is over the course of the three years, um, you know, you just keep reading, right? Because we're all sort of that intellectual curiosity. And as I would sort of read along, two things happened. Different agents would sort of pop up on my radar. And then different molecular mechanisms of aging would sort of pop up on my radar. And when they intersected, you're like, aha, this is huge, right? Because you know, there's a million free radical scavengers out there. There's a million plants that, you know, can do roughly the same thing. And do you need 17 of them? Probably not, right? But when something new popped up, I'm like, oh, this is really cool. As a result of this, spermidine became huge on my hit parade. And by now, like everyone's like, oh yeah, spermidine, old hat. But at the time, it, it wasn't. It was something completely new and completely different. And as I went in to analyze exactly what it did, it introduced some like really cool concepts. So number one here, here's a molecular, you hate molecules, but here it is. <laughs> uh, spermidine is a long positively charged chain with nitrogen groups in it, right? So it's like a little worm, it's positively charged, whatever. DNA has major and minor grooves in it, right? Because it's sort of like the twisted, spirally DNA thing. And it's negatively charged. So what spermidine does is it fits into the grooves of your DNA and it kind of protects it. I'd never done any spermidine research. So I called a good friend of mine, Bill Andrews, who's the king of telomeres. You know, everyone knows Bill. And I go, hey, if I said that it bubble wrapped your DNA, would that be a reasonable metaphor, Right. And he thought about it and he went through his like, you know, chemical, I'm a genius, blah, 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 you know, and then he goes, yeah, you could say that it does. It does sort of bubble wrap your DNA and keep it safe. And we know in test tubes um, with spermidine, DNA then has less damage for, you know, free radical damage, less oxidation, uh, less UV radiation damage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a jump to say that it does it in a cell, um, but we know it does it in a test tube. Um, and we also know that having uh, spermidine in your cells protects it from a variety of things. It reduces the risk of uh, like autoimmune diseases and, and a variety of other things. So I like to think that spermidine is the bubble wrap solution for your DNA. Um, it does not change the primary structure. It does not change any epigenetics. It doesn't get in the way if you need to open up your DNA to, you know, to translate or to make any proteins, but it definitely serves to decrease the risk of DNA damage. So I think that is an incredibly cool concept. Uh, and now I'm a huge believer in spermidine. Uh, and of course it does other things as well. One of the big things it does is it increases autophagy in cells. And that sort of made my big hit parade because we didn't have any giant uh, things to increase autophagy. Since then, we probably, you know, there are a variety of things that do it, but spermidine probably wins uh, in terms of the aut- autophagy. Uh, but it does a variety of other cool things as well. And here's another little tidbit that I learned. There is something in your mitochondria called the mitochondrial transition permeability pore. 
And what it does over time is it flickers. When you are young, your mitochondria are young and healthy, it flickers and it sort of like serves as a pop-off valve and it lets toxic substances out of your mitochondria into the cytosol, but in very small, tiny quantities so it doesn't do anything bad. As you get older and as your mitochondria age, it just sort of stays open longer. And it floods your cell with NAD, with cytochrome C, pieces and parts of your, of your mitochondria that are sort of falling to pieces. And it makes sort of, it does two things. Number one, your mitochondria doesn't function as well. Two, it's sort of, it's toxic to the rest of the cell. And if you don't control the mitochondrial transposition poor, basically your mitochondria dies and it just destroys the cell. And studies have demonstrated that if like, for example, if you're having a bad heart attack, the controllability of that pore will sort of determine if you die of a heart attack or not. And so I went through, oh my gosh, we need to control this poor thing. And it turns out that there are probably five or six things that do it. But one thing on the list was spermidine. Like, oh my God, this is fantastic. So now I'm a huge spermidine fan. And that's that rates pretty highly in the book. Why is spermidine so expensive relative to other supplements or adjuvants? That's one that's like pretty highly priced. It is highly priced. And the answer is, I don't actually know the answers to that question. I Because I sort of just I don't, I want to say I discovered it, but became aware of it. Right. I ended up meeting, there's a lovely lady, Leslie Kenny, and she owns Oxford health span and they, they make spermidine. We've become good friends and the product's fantastic and it is pricey. And you know what? I never bothered to ask her why it was so pricey. So I'm going to ask her since we get off this call. Yeah. I'm just out of curiosity because to your point, as I've gone to these different biohacking conferences and, you know, talk to other people, spermidine comes up more and more and more. And just like you talked about, there's a lot of reasons why it's becoming so popular. And I don't know if it's because of its popularity that it's expensive or if it's because of the way it has to be processed. processed. Oh, no, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ironically, the top adjuvant in this new book is Fizatin, correct? Which yeah. is extremely cheap relative, yeah. mean, which yeah. is awesome. So I started your your suggested protocol of where you do that massive dump for a couple of days where you take like 12 or 14 pills in one day and the next day, which is supposed to help with uh, reducing senescent cells, correct? And correct. then one pill the rest of the month each day. But yeah, talk about Fizatin since it's so highly rated and it's so cheap. It seems like low hanging fruit for people that want to kind of jump into the longevity pool. Yeah, so Fisetin is amazing. Fisetin is just, it does incredibly well. Like it's not a monster standout except for senescent cells, but it just does incredibly well in like in every category. Now, you're going to kill me. I don't really remember all the specifics about it. I can tell you it does help with your mitochondrial transition pore. It is a free radical scavenger. It just does something amazing in, in each category, uh, reduces fat collections, for example. But the senescent cell is extremely important. And just as a, as a recoup of what senescent cells are, just in case you know people don't know, um, some people call them zombie cells. I call them grumpy old man cells. And the reason I do that, because you take a perfectly normal, happy functioning cell and it undergoes DNA damage. That's not uncommon because every cell every day has about 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth DNA errors per cell per day. So it's a ton. Uh, but the cell then goes into a state of quiescence where it just sort of sits there to repair itself. Um, and if it can, great, right? And if it can't, three things happen. One, it becomes apoptotic and dies, which I call it like the polite way out, right? It's not no, no harm, no fuss, boom, you're dead, fine. Or two, it becomes cancerous, which is not so good. Or three, it becomes senescent. And a senescent cell changes the morphology. It becomes flatter, more globular. The inner organelles don't function as well. The mitochondria become distorted. Everything sort of becomes distorted. You get more protein accumulations and everything is named after sort of the cell. So there's the senescence associated blank, like whatever it is. And one of the big things it does, it has a senescence associated secretory activity and it lets out just a zillion negative cytokinin. So it's extraordinarily inflammatory. And as you get older and as you have pathologic tissues, you get more and more senescent cells. Your immune system, when you are younger, like the natural killer cells come along and they get rid of these senescent cells. But as you have more senescent cells and as your immune system itself becomes senescent, the number sort of skyrockets over the course of time. And studies have demonstrated that if you can get rid of your senescent cells, you're just going to do extraordinarily better. Historically, the big treatments have been quercetin and desinitib. Quercetin, of course, is in book one. And these studies were just coming out when I wrote it. So it was an inkling, but certainly nothing solid. And as it turns out, different senescent cells are different, right? If it's a fat cell versus a bone cell versus a this cell versus a that cell, 
And different agents can get rid of different types of senescent cells. So it turns out that quercetin and fisetin are very similar in the cell types that they can get rid of, which is kind of nice. The big studies, of course, use denacetab and the quercetin, and they demonstrate that it's sort of like you need to have high quantities in your bloodstream for like two to three days, and then you can you know, go back to normal doses for you know, a few months. Um, and as you get older, of course, you're going to have more cells, so you want to do a little bit more frequently. Um, but fisetin has proved to be just extremely good at getting rid of a certain cell type of senescent cells, which is why you talk about the bolus therapy and then the intermittent therapy. The daily smaller dose is just for the side effects of the mitochondrial health and, and, and all of the other wonderful things it does. Uh, but the senescent cells definitely need a high dose intermittently. And kind of along the same line as the resveratrol versus terastilbene, you have berberine comparable in some way superior to metformin, which is in that first book, of course, and metformin has a lot of pros to it. But the second book, you do allude to the fact that there is this kind of argument or this debate, like which one's better, metformin and berberine, but they all have, they both have their pros. Is there any new research that's come out since this book, this newest book was launched? Because I know you said this was basically a year ago, they had all this information. Is there any new information showing metformin versus berberine, or is it still a similar train of thought that what you wrote in the book, as far as them both having their, their pros? I don't think there's been too much lately. It's really interesting from a pharmacological point of view or and molecular basis, because the molecules look extraordinarily different. There, you know, I, I kind of went into this thinking that they were going to be very similar and therefore, you know, their act activities and such are going to be similar. Um, and they are, they do act in a very similar fashion, but molecularly, they're very different. So you have to wonder like how that happens sort of on an evolutionary scale. Um, but they both do fantastic things, right? They're, they're both AMP kinase activators, which makes them partial mTOR inhibitors. They change your microbiota. They do just a, a lot of things. But then there are sub things that some do and some don't, right? So metformin, controls the mitochondrial transition pore, which is amazing. And there was no evidence that berberine did that. Anyway, so there, there, there are slightly different things that they both do. And my favorite study actually demonstrated in people, like real people, that 500 milligrams of each one separated by eight hours a day was the most beneficial way to go. You know, when I wrote book one, I was on this huge metformin kick and I probably took far too much every day. I took 850 twice a day for my body size, which is probably a bit overkill. And then after sort of doing the research on berberine, I'm like, oh my God, this is truly amazing. And let's, let's, let's look at the synergistic effects rather than assuming that one thing is going to do everything. And this is also sort of a theme that sort of came out of book two as well. You don't need the same high doses of individual agents for things that are synergistic. 500 of one, 500 of the other together on a daily basis seems to be more beneficial than high doses of metformin with, with none of the side effects. So I thought that, you know what, that's, that's now I think the way to go. And those are more so for, well, I guess there's a lot of properties like you spoke to, but especially with reducing uh, blood glucose levels, right? Well, so yeah, I mean, that, that's why people take metformin in the first place. And, and that's, I always forget about it. But yes, I mean, obviously. On the other hand, so if you want to skip to glycation, it's one of my new favorite subjects. I've decided that there are seven different steps to defeating glycation. Um, and you don't want to go whole hog on any one particular one. But if you sort of pick it off in little pieces, by the time you get done with step seven, your glucose is completely under control. And I know this because I live it. I'm sort of famous or infamous rather for eating a ton of junk food. I love donuts. I eat donuts every day. I don't watch my diet at all, um, but all of my labs are pristine. Um, and I know this because like, I, I checked it out uh, a month ago. I'm like, oh my God, I was a little fearful. I have to admit that maybe I'm wrong. But as it turns out, all my labs are pristine on my crap diet. So I know this stuff works. No way. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> Anti-aging longevity expert. Love donuts and junk food. That's funny. But again, to your point, you're kind of proven that the stuff you talk about works. Oh, yeah. It, it absolutely works. You know, I get mocked because I take 70 some agents on a daily basis. But I don't take, you know, the bottles always say take three or four capsules. Yeah, I like these recommended doses, but all of the studies are done on something in isolation. So if you think about all of these synergistic effects, I take small amounts of many things, assuming that there will be some sort of global synergy. And um, as far as I know, it seems to be working. Gosh, that's great. I'm an N of one, right? So I don't, right. don't tell your people to eat donuts every day. <laughs> and you mentioned the panacea. You might have added a couple more, two or three more. Were there any from the second book that you would consider putting into that panacea? 
So I really want to put spermidine into the panacea, but one of the concerns about the panacea was cost. Yeah. Right? So if people don't have cost issues, I would absolutely add it. Fisetin, depending on which one you get, can be either dirt cheap or very expensive. There is a question of bioavailability, right? And so the more bioavailable it is, the more expensive it is. That, that's sort of like a risk benefit. So I, I generally stick with the panacea. And then unless people push me, they're like, you know, I could take three or four more things. What would I take? Which actually leads me to the other kind of fun thing that I did in book two, which I wish I'd have done in book one, is I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a chart in the back that has icons of body parts, right? And the idea, um, when people sort of read book one, they're like, okay, this is great for longevity, but you know, I'm really worried about my brain or I'm really worried about my gut. So I've, everything in book two is cross-referenced by body part. So if you want to say, okay, well, I'm going to do the panacea, but I also want it to take care of my skin. What do I take? So you go to the chart um, and I'll tell you exactly what does what for what body part. The problem, of course, is it's not completely inclusive because I can only include studies that have been done. Like I can guess that such and such is going to help with your brain, but I have no evidence until someone does the study. And a lot of these studies are limited by money, right? There's no money in these natural agents. So no one's going to spend millions of dollars proving that it does something. So the only studies that I can sort of refer to are the ones that obviously have been done. Right. And that's what you said in a lot of the chapters. It's like, these are the scores I can give it now. I would... I would guesstimate that the scores will be higher over time, but like based on the research, that this is where they are. So yeah, a lot of these agents will probably do more than than the research shows now. But to your point, how long before that research comes out? Because there's not a lot of money to be made. And it's also it's also really interesting. So depending on the country of the, you know, the origin of it, it sort of depends on how much research gets done, right? Mm. So if something comes from Japan, they got money, right? They're gonna be amazing studies done. Uh, Delphinidin from the Mackay Berry in Argentina, they don't have a ton of money to be thrown at this thing. So when you look at it, you think this is like the next upcoming uh, molecule. I love Delphinidin, but there's just no research money for it. So, you know, grain of salt. Right, right. So what does your regimen, what does your anti-aging longevity regimen look like outside of taking these agents and outside of your sterling diet? What do you, what else do you do for <laughs> anti-aging and longevity? Fantastic question. So I've developed what I call the longevity pyramid. And the sort of is based on the fifth grade diet pyramid that we were all shown. You're young, a very long time ago, right? The stuff on the bottom of the pyramid, you're supposed to do a lot of the stuff on the top of the pyramid, maybe not so much, right? The bottom of the pyramid is what I do on a daily basis, you know, if people are into caloric restriction, that's in there. So dietary concerns, which I clearly fail at, but, you know, good for everybody else that can. Exercise is on there because we know that exercise is fantastic. It helps your telomeres, helps your AMP kinase. It does all these wonderful things. So exercise is definitely on there. And I'm a true proponent of that. Of course, they're the daily agents that you take. I put peptides on there as well, the bioregulating peptides, because that's pretty important. And of course, red light, infrared light's on there. I sit in front of that silly thing incessantly, as we've already talked about, because I just think it walks on water. But so that, those are things that you do on a daily basis. And then going up the pyramid, there are things I do like every month or two. So I do my senolytic therapy usually every two months. So I'll take the huge doses of a fisetin, huge doses of quercetin. I sort of rotate those with the desinitab. It's really hard to get that because it's a chemotherapy agent. Um, it's ridiculously expensive and it's hard to talk a pharmacy into giving me chemotherapy agents for a disease I don't have. So that, that that's a bit tough. The only thing, I, I convinced some um, chemical lab company that I'm actually a researcher. And so they send me all this stuff and it says, of course, not for human consumption. And I immediately like mix it in, in something and <laughs> swallow it down, um, which I shouldn't do, but I do. Additionally, I do exosome infusions uh, once a month. There's a, you know, the big war about stem cells versus exosomes and stem cells, of course, are amazing. A lot of incredibly beneficial activities have been demonstrated, but of course, to get real stem cells, you have to leave the country and it's extremely expensive. You know, it's the Bahamas or Mexico or Panama or whatever. It's been demonstrated that exosomes, which are stem cell products, of course, can probably constitute 75 to 80% of the benefits without actually having the stem cells. Um, and there's a variety of exosome companies in the U.S., and you can sort of get your hands on those. Of course, the FDA says you're not supposed to systemically infuse them, but we all do because that's just what we do. 
Um, so I do that once uh, once a month. So it helps with systemic inflammation and, and regeneration and all that kind of stuff. That is pretty much all I do. If you keep going up the pyramid, it's sort of for older, unhealthy people. People were working on plasmapheresis right now. I think there's going to you know be some sort of strategy behind that. And then, of course, at the very tip top of the pyramid, there's cryogenics, right? Because you can only freeze your brain once. I think that's you know, up it's up there with mummification. You're sort of screwed at that point. So it's the all or nothing. I'm I'm gonna either you know be frozen or dehydrated, and that that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that's quite the list, but that, that's cool. It's things you do every day, and then you work your way up the pyramid, just like just like the food pyramid. Let's see. Is there anything? Because I know you're way way into skin health as well. Is there anything else you do? And I know a lot of people listening to this podcast that are into red light therapy are way into skin health because I think that's, and I actually posted a uh, a series of questionnaires on, on Instagram through BioLite, like what do people use red light therapy for? And skin health was by far the top reason people use it. So my question to you is, is there anything else that you do to you know augment your skin health and kind of stave off the uh, aging of skin? Oh my God, I could talk about that for a million years. <laughs> I figured. Of course, right? So there's there's topical stuff you put on your skin. There's systemic stuff you put on your skin. Which really, so what's interesting about skin is obviously it's, it's many layered and there's a section on skin morphology in the beginning of book two. And I talk about it like it's a birthday cake with all of the various layers and what you need to do for the various layers. And the key is getting agents. Um, there's something called the dermal epidermal junction. Um, and if you look, if you think about a piece of birthday cake, there's like the top piece of bread. Well, there's the frosting on the top, right? It's hard to get stuff through. There's the dermal layer or the, the epidermal layer. And then there's the dermal epidermal junction that would be like the frosting sort of, but it's in a variegated fashion. And then there's the dermis. The dermis has a lot of blood flow, but the epidermis has none. So depending on how old you are, will determine how fluctuating the dermal epidermal junction is, which will determine then how much stuff has to be oral and how much stuff has to be topical. That probably seemed incredibly ridiculous to, to try to explain. But so the answer is the younger you are, the more stuff will get from your systemic intake to your skin. The older you are, the more you have to sort of rely on topical. Um, since I'm sort of somewhere in the middle of old, young, I don't know. I use both, clearly, right? So in, interestingly, like hyaluronic acid is, is horribly underappreciated as an oral agent. What's really cool about hyaluronic acid is it doesn't actually get deposited into your skin all that much. But what it does is it goes to your fibroblast and it tells your fibroblast to make more endogenous hyaluronic acid and that gets deposited in your skin. Um, I love the idea that everyone's walking around with those giant water bottles saying, oh, I'm dehydrated. Look how dry my skin is. I'm going to drink four gallons of water today. Well, that's really nice because you're going to pee like a racehorse, but it's not going to stick in your skin because you are hyaluronic deficient. So if you can increase the number of hyaluronic acid molecules in, in your tissue, you are going to self-hydrate because I think it's like one molecule to 8,000 molecule is the ratio of water to hyaluronic acid. So that is extraordinarily important. Uh, slathering it directly on your skin is good as well. Some of it gets in, some of it doesn't, it just depends on molecular weight. Uh, but that, that's kind of crucial. I also talk about oral collagen in the book. And it, it's sort of the same as a hyaluronic acid. Your the collagen doesn't get deposited in you anywhere. But what it does is it goes to the fibroblasts again. Well, first it goes to your GI tract and it gets sort of digested in diantripeptides. And these serve as messengers that go to your fibroblasts that tell your body to make more collagen. And one of the reasons our skin drips over time, of course, is collagen failure. So if you can talk your body into making more collagen, then you're going, of course, to just do better, right? In addition, there's a variety of other agents that you can take or put on that help. For example, Centella Asiatica. It's amazing. If you Google Centella, it'll be in every Korean face product that there is. All of them. It's amazing. They don't put it in American products. And I don't know why. I just think they don't know what it is. But that's an amazing thing. It's oral, it's topical, in incredible stuff. So there's a whole lot of agents that you can take systemically that help. And then of course, topically, like, you know, everyone goes and spends a fortune on that sort of stuff. I actually, my skincare is twofold. I either A, get it from South Korea or B, I make it myself because you go through these list of agents and then you look at actual products that are available on the market and you think, oh my God, the concentration is like 0. 0.000 such and such. And like, that's moderately useless. So I just make it myself. Um, my kids make fun of me because the kitchen always looks like, you know, some scientific experiment um, exploded, but it is what it is. And actually just yesterday we were working on 
a hydrating mist for skin because my sister lives in the desert and she's like, I used to make this stuff called swamp juice. And she's like, number one, that sounds disgusting. But two, can can you make it more focused to the Arabian desert? Because she lives in um, in Abu Dhabi. So we are working on that. So there are three different formulations of skin mist sitting in my tester bathroom at the moment. When are those going to be released to the public? I have no blooming idea. I don't even know <laughs> if they ever will. But it's fun. Right, it's right. really fun to play with. But it's it's truly amazing. Products, some of them are good and some of them are terrible. And my goal is to make better products. But I also don't want to be seen as one of these crazy doctors that say, aha, here's your problem, buy my product, right? I need right. I, I, scientific legitimacy and I don't want to be seen as a shyster, which is why I write these books, right? Because I want people to understand this is why you need this. Um, right. But then along the crazy skin thing, because I could obsess about this forever. Keep going. <laughs> I'm a huge believer in what I call skin speckle. Like Botox will make your skin look healthier because it's not wrinkled. I mean, you're not, it doesn't make you any younger, but it makes you all look younger, i.e. the speckle. I love PRPing. I PRP my face like probably every every month or two. I don't know if this camera's not good enough to be able to see that I have little tiny bruises everywhere because I did it to myself yesterday. And then of course, lasers are absolutely amazing. I'm the medical director of a laser skin center uh, in Florida, and I'm a true believer in sort of like topical rejuvenation. So being down in Florida, lots of sun most of the year, if not all of it. So what is your take on UV exposure to the skin? Do you do any use any sunscreens or have any homemade things that you do to mitigate that? Or or uh, do you just rely on your strategies to reduce the risk of UV radiation? Uh, so good question. So during the day on normal week, I don't see a whole lot of sun. I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm in the OR like all day. So I generally rely on um, topical stuff. So I take obviously a lot of astaxanthin. So what's interesting about UV radiation is it actually melts your DNA together and something called cyclobutane, there's CPDs, cyclobutane, dis something or others. My brain is like failing me. Uh, but there's two over-the-counter products that come from tropical plants that increase your DNA mechanisms such that your CPD damage drops. Uh, one of them is called fern block. It's polypodium. That's in the book. Another one's called AC11, which isn't. But again, it, it goes back to plants have been having you know th this damage or this stress for a very, very long time. What have they done? So these are tropical plants. They have a ton of radiation. They're going to have the same DNA damage that we do. So somehow they develop molecules that are sort of capable of increasing DNA repair mechanisms. So I do that on a daily basis. For days that I'm actually going to be out in the sun during the day, then I'll use sunscreen but I'm not a huge fan of it. So I try not to. Right. Are there any other thoughts or suggestions relative to skincare? Otherwise I have, I have another closing question. <laughs> oh gosh. Skincare. There's just I, protect it. It's just, you don't have that much of it. And it, and it also depends on sort of like what your ethnicity is, right? White skin is very different from black skin, which is very different from, you know, all of the things in the middle. And it, it's really interesting because I, I, you know, I Botox and PRP people all the time and black skin tends to be thicker. It has more oil secretion. So it lasts longer, better. I'm always so jealous, right? Those of us with wimpy white skin, it's significantly thinner. It's cheaper to take care of because you need less Botox because it's thinner. On the other hand, it just becomes very translucent and sort of crappy over time. So you really need to be more aggressive. Uh, and it also depends on where you live. I live in Florida where it's very hydrating. People can't stand the humidity here, but it's great for your skin. As soon as I go out to the desert, I feel like a dehydrated crocodile. Um, so it just depends on who you are and where you are and how aggressive you want to be. Right. Kind of backpedaling to the longevity and anti-aging protocols or, or supplements, adjuvants. Is it ever too young to start this or is there advantages to starting younger? I don't know if this is an obvious question or not, but I guess in my mind, and I've, that's why I've been obsessed with this for a long, long time, is I figured if I started earlier by being healthier and in kind of initiating some of these processes or just trying to mitigate the reduction of certain levels as I get older and I just turned 33. So I'm not really to the precipice of that 40 year mark, which seems to be the tipping edge. But back to my question, is it ever too young to start or is it something where you should maybe not go full bore into this stuff or do you do it? I get this question all the time. So this actually... I'm going to explain it to you and you're going to be like, well, that makes sense, right? 
So there are simple things that everyone can do to be healthy, right? We all know that if you're 300 pounds and you're 10 years old, you're not going to do well, right? So diet and exercise are crucial at every step along the way, right? You don't want to wait till you're 35 and go, aha, now I'm going to be like a mountain climber. It doesn't work that way, right? So that is important. Um, in terms of everything else, you need to understand the mechanism by which you're changing. So if you look at epigenetics, epigenetics starts changing probably from, you know, by the time you're a full-blown teenager, you're going to start having negative teenage epigenetic changes, right? So the teenager that's out there smoking pot or doing whatever, those are negative epigenetic modifiers. In addition, like whatever diet you're on, it's negative epigenetic modifiers. So taking care of your epigenetics, you need to do it at every step of your existence. And there are absolute beneficial things that you can take for your epigenetics, like green tea, ECG, is one of them. Self-purifane is one of them. They're just like epigenin. These things are just going to protect your genetics for your whole life. So it's never too early to start that. Astaxanthin, your, your free radical damaging is, depending on, of course, where you live and what you do, is going to be outrageous you can never go wrong taking astaxanthin, right? These are beneficial things. The crucial question, however, is when you get to actually supplements, which means you're supplementing things that your body already has, you need to be careful with feedback loops. Therefore, you don't want to take too much of stuff that you're not deficient in until you actually are becoming deficient in it. There is no point in taking NAD until you're actually starting to drop off because too much is not necessarily good. Right. So I, you know, I know 30 year olds come to me like, ah, I'm getting NAD boluses. Like that's, it's expensive and it's pointless, right? You're not going to do anything good for yourself. Your sirtuins have not turned off yet between 35 and 40, your sirtuins start to drop. So by 38, 39, 40, yeah, you need to start activating your sirtuins, but it's pointless to do it early. Right. Um, but then you also have to think about family histories. If your family has cardiovascular problems very early in life, then that's something you need to think about. If everyone in your family is diabetic by the time they're 40, that's something you need to think about. But if you are completely entirely healthy with no medical problems, then we have to assume that you're on a normal track. Then there are different times in your life to start different therapies. No, that makes that sense. sense. So, so it's like, yes, but take these considerations into play. Which but you have to know what that. you're doing and yeah. why. Yep. And that's a lot of things that I've talked with other people on this podcast about that, especially when we're talking about, you know, they they were talking about vitamins, minerals, and other supplements, but you need to know what you're taking or why you're taking it. And is it actually having an effect? Is it having the effect you want? Meaning you have to retest your blood levels. So that's a good point. And that's something, quite frankly, I need to be doing more consistently is, is taking blood panels to see where I am. But just remember, there's there's a lot of things that aren't going to show up on blood panels. Right, right, right. We don't we don't have a community version of your sirtuin testing. Right. We just don't. So we know from population scientific studies when it theoretically should go down. Right. But you can't go to your you know Quest Diagnostics and get your sirtuin tested or your NAD levels. There's some indirect markers of like mitochondrial health, but to your point, there's nothing that specifically measures mitochondrial function or dysfunction, correct? At least not to my knowledge. That is absolutely correct. Like you can't measure your superoxide dismutase levels, right? right? You just, you can't. So you need to make some assumptions about where you are in life. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. For the things that we can check, check it. Absolutely, right? And it, for example, micronutrient deficiencies are a perfect example. As you get older and your diet becomes more and more sort of pigeonholed, you are more likely to have micronutrient deficiencies. So you don't make SOD if you don't have manganese or you don't have zinc or you don't have copper, right? Too much is too much, but too little is going to, going to kill you. When you are younger, people's diets tend to be more broad-based until they get old and set in their ways. And though, you know, then they don't eat spinach every day or whatever the hell it is. So when you are younger, you need a bit of a vitamin, but as you get older, it becomes more and more important to have a broad-based vitamin, which is why I tell everyone over 40 that they need to be on prenatals. Like you don't need the dose, but you need to be on the concept. Right. No, that makes sense. And maybe one of the I keep saying closing questions, but one of my last questions, I guess, Sandy, is you said, I think before we started recording, that there's already been a year's worth of new information, like you're excited to kind of divulge. I don't know if it'll be in a book or otherwise, but uh, can you give us any insight into what some of these new newfound discoveries are? 
Sure. So last week, I just, it's actually not new. It's just new to me. Maybe other people will have heard of this. So we've all heard of hemoglobin, right? Carries oxygen around your body. There's myoglobin, stores it in your muscle. There's neuroglobin. So this is a globin uh, that sits in your brain. And what's cool about it is in various areas of your brain that it needs lots of oxygen or lots of glucose, you have various concentrations of it, and it protects you from hypoxic damage, right? So for it, what's, it, what's it really interesting as a kind of like an offset us versus them, seals and whales that are underwater for a significant period of time have hundreds of times the neuroglobin in their brains, right? So the oxygen actually gets stored in their brains and it gets titrated out as they need it because we couldn't possibly be under, or mammals, right? We couldn't possibly be underwater for that long without significant neural damage, so how does that apply to us? Well, if you're climbing a mountain or if you're having an ischemic stroke or something of that nature, having that is extraordinarily important in your brain. It has also been shown in lower quantities. Um, it actually does a whole lot of other things. It acts as a free radical scavenger. It acts as a messaging system between different systems within your brain. And of course, anything good in life decreases with age. And of course, they've demonstrated that these levels drop precipitously over time. And it can be fixed if you know about it. So it turns out estrogens are huge in terms of keeping your neuroglobins intact, right? So if you're a perimenopausal woman and you're debating, well, should I have you know HRT or not? The answer is, oh my God, yes, because you're gonna lose brain function, right? Um, and then there are a variety of other sort of agents that we've never heard of that can help as well. So it's kind of cool, right? Another topic, like I've just been obsessed with the sirtuins in each of the sort of little categories, and we're all on resveratrol or terastilbene, or we should be, right? They're not so great for sirtuin-3, which is what drives your mitochondria. So if you want to drive your mitochondria, uh, the big one in, in this department actually comes from magnolia, right? And I was like, why the hell do people drink, eat magnolia? I'm like, well, this, this, this is it, right? That's, that's, that's the one. Um, so I'm sort of like taking these deep dives in all of these various like things. Uh, and then lastly, here's a little tidbit. So I've become obsessed with glycosylation. And one of the ways that you get rid of methyl glycol, which is a break. So glucose gets broken down into a variety of things. There's three major intermediates that then become AGEs. There's glycol and methyl glycol are the, are the big two. And you have systems to get rid of that that, of course, fail over time. Um, it's called your glyosylase system. There's glyosylase one and glyosylase two, which of course these enzymes fail over time. The cool thing is you can activate your glyoxylase one to get rid of your, your glucose problems. So that's another little thing that will end up in, in book three at some point. I hope book three comes out. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm reading and writing as we speak. <laughs> well, Sandy, I appreciate all your time and all your information. Love your books. Love the information you put out. Where can people go to learn more from you and about you? Fantastic question. So I am on uh, Instagram, which is Kaufman Anti-Aging. I generally just post either lectures or wherever I can be found there. Um, my website is kaufmanprotocol.com. I will tell you that it's being actively rebuilt right now to sort of reflect the changes from book one to book two. I will tell people that on, it, there used to be an app that I created to sort of help people get through all of this due to a zillion technical issues and clearly hiring the wrong company to do it. Um, I had to take it down. Right. So unfortunately, I get emails after every podcast that says we tried to find your app and we can't. And the reason is I apologize. It doesn't exist anymore. But I answer all questions. People tend to email me a ton after, after discussions like this. And I answer all questions individually. Me, myself, and I, there is no one else. It does take me a bit of time. So if someone emails me, I just ask for their patience. And I will get to every question personally. But the email is on the website. So it's very easy to find. Perfect. Yeah, and we'll include the, the website and your Instagram handle on social media. So people can go check you out and follow you and continue to learn more. But again, Sandy, appreciate your time. I know everyone's going to listen to this episode at least once or twice and, and accrue all the information you lay down. And I highly recommend everyone, not just her newest book, because of course, the first book covers entirely different adjuvants and supplements. So you want to check them both out. So be sure to do that. And we'll have the links for both of those books in the show notes as well. For Dr. Sandra Coffin and Dr. Mike Belkowski, we're signing <laughs> off of the Red Light Report. You all have a fantastic week. <laughs>